Justice. Good. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Tom, for uh, for allowing us this interview. We're very pleased and uh, very proud to have you as uh, a cover story on Jersey Man Magazine. I want to, I've done some background on you, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but the one question I wanted to start out with, and it's kind of like the 2,000-pound elephant that's in the room, so we might as well get it out of the way. Is this my real hair? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, I won't do any hair jokes. You won't do any weight jokes, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be in good shape. But uh, the question I want to start out with is, wh what was it like replacing a legend in Harry Callis? You know, um, Scott and I have talked about this, Francie, because Scott, you know, took over on on radio. Uh, I took over on television. We've kind of just tried to be ourselves. Um, I was with the Phillies from '01 through '05 as the pre and post game host. And I did two innings of radio, then went to the Mets for uh, two years to do radio full time, all nine innings. Uh, and then the Phillies in the middle of my contract asked if I would come back to eventually take over for Harry when he retired. So Harry and I talked about it often. Um, and he, and it's true. I mean, many people have told me this, you just had to be yourself when the day came. And that's really what I've tried to do. I'm very different than Harry. There's no question. And he, is irreplaceable. Um, I still wish that he was here to call some of the games that these guys have played because this is a great group. But I think Scott and I have both said that, you know, we'll never ever replace Harry, just as if as Larry Anderson never could replace Whitey. Um, but we succeeded him. We were the next in line. And I think that's how we've kind of looked at it, that it would probably take some time to, for people to get used to us. Um, and we just had to, to do the job the only way we could. And Harry and I talked about it too. And he said, he said, T-Mac, you can't be somebody that you're not because people will find out and they, they will. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, who I am on the air is really who I am as a person. I mean, I, I like to have a good time. I love the game. I love, lo I've loved it since I can remember, played it since I can remember. Uh, and I've just tried to, you know, be myself. So you, you actually had some prep time knowing that you would eventually be the re his replacement. That did was it, the thought, did yeah. Did that make it easier? I think? I think it made it easier. Um, you know, I never really thought about it because I felt like he was going to be around forever. I really did. Yeah. You know, when I came back from the Mets uh, happily because I, I had a very good job up there, but I loved it here when I was here. And when they asked me to come back, um, you know, I was floored. Uh, but I just, I figured Harry would be here forever because he's been an icon forever. And you just don't expect that an icon will ever leave. Right. And that he would leave on his own terms. Uh, that would be the key. And uh, so I never really thought about it. I just wanted to get better. And that's still my thought. I just want to get better. I, I just want to be the best I possibly can. I want to, you know, do this as good as I possibly can do it because it's new to me. Had he talked about retiring? I mean, had he... Was he, had, he yeah, he had told me, uh, his youngest son, Kane, right. uh, who is a wonderful singer. I mean, he's been gifted with Harry's voice. Uh, he was just starting college uh, my second year back. And I think the thought was, once he was done with college at the University of Miami, uh, that maybe Harry would think about it a little bit. But it, that was that was really a brief conversation. I never brought it up because I always wanted him around. We sat next to each other in the office. Um, I, you know, he always told me how much he enjoyed our interaction when I was in the stands doing the things, which was cool, because that was new to both of us. I didn't know how it would fly for anybody, uh, because I'm a purist, and I don't like interruptions to games. Uh, but it worked, and it'll work you know, in the future with Greg Murphy doing it too for us now. Um, so we really never talked about it, but he, he had said that the one time. you know, And, and I said, I basically didn't respond to it because, uh, like I said, we all wanted him around for as long as he could be around. Sure. <clears throat> well, keeping with our theme, you are a true Jersey guy. You were born in Jersey City, yep. correct? Went to Brick Township. Yeah, Brick School. Memorial. Brick That's Memorial. That's the other side of town. Okay, yeah. okay my bad. Um, your wife, Meg, mm -hmm. and four kids. What are their names and ages? Uh, Patrick is my oldest. He's uh, 17, which means he's driving, so everybody watch out. Uh, Tommy's my 14-year-old. Maggie is my 12 year old and Carrie is my nine year old. Um, good mix. Yeah. Yeah. Two boys, two girls. It's a totally different world from, yeah. from two to, from the two boys to the two girls. Uh, the two boys are 
involved in every athletic event they could possibly be involved in. Although that's kind of waning. They're kind of finding their their niche in certain sports. And the girls like sports, but they, you know, they'd rather dance and sing and do the things that uh, that most girls their age would do. So you did it the right way. I had a daughter, and then I tried for a son. I had th- triplet daughters. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I did. Yeah, you did it the right way. I would not recommend uh, the way I went about it. Well, I'll tell you, I never thought. I thought after I had the two boys that we would have boys. I just thought that that's the way it was yeah, going to go. Yeah. Uh, but the girls have been. I mean, they're beautiful. They're refreshing. Um, I've lo- I mean, I love watching their age right now, the oh, way they are. Because they're totally different than the boys were at this age. And a, a daughter's love to a father is something that's really unique. Well, and it's, I have a different relationship with both yeah, of them. Of I mean, it's, 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 and it's great. With all four of them, really. How did you, uh, <clears throat> how'd you get your start in broadcasting? Was it something that you always wanted to do? How did you, were you able to break in into what is a very tough field? To yeah, I, I, I've been fortunate on two fronts. I was able to break in, but I, I haven't moved. I've basically been in New Jersey since I was born. Uh, and that, I'm very thankful of that. I talk to kids all the time who have to go out to different venues uh, to establish themselves. And I was able to establish myself in New Jersey, which was great. I, I always wanted to play. I was like every other kid who was a baseball player. I always thought, I'm going to play Major League Baseball. Um, and I was okay at it. I, you know, I thought I was better than I was. Uh, but I went to Trenton State College to play baseball. You know, I had been decided on a couple of other schools or had thought about other schools, Montclair State, North Carolina Wesleyan, Indiana, um, for no apparent reason, but I wanted to watch college basketball, and Bob Knight was the king at that point. Uh, but I went to Trenton State because my older brother was there. He played there, hurt his arm, and wound up stopping after his freshman year. Um, and I had the rudest awakening of all when I got there and tried out and was cut. And I was stunned. Uh, but I always wanted to do something in baseball or do something in sports. So I was a biology major, which my thought was at the time that I would be a doctor of sports medicine. <laughs> That's a hoot to think about that. And then with those first few years of being in labs and stuff like that, I realized there is no way I am going to do this. And I had a, you know, my other dream was to be a broadcaster, but I never knew anybody that had broadcast. So I knew doctors, I knew accountants, I knew lawyers. Those were the people that I thought I could be because those are the people I knew. I knew no writers, anything like that. So when I was a biology major, I had a teacher who's still there. His name's Gary Lipton. He was a great biology teacher. He made biology fun, if you can ever think, think of that could happen. We met one time during my junior year, and he said, really, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're not cut out for this. And I had been writing at that point, first for the Princeton Packet, and then for the Trenton Times. Um, And I decided at that point that I was going to try to A, be a writer, and then eventually parlay that into possibly being a broadcaster. So I started taking every internship possible. New Jersey Network. um, Michael Michael Barkham got to start. Yeah, I mean, it was right around the corner from Trenton State College. It was the greatest thing in the world. Pat Scanlon was the sports director. Jerry Henry was his assistant, who was outstanding. Um, Bill Bowen, who produced the Yankee games, was one of the guys that interned with me at the time. I interned at WTTM, a radio station in Trenton that was 50 years old at the time. And I just started getting behind the microphone, holding the microphone, you know, going out and just getting sound for people, you know, doing sports updates on TTM. And from writing to doing those things, I had what I thought was going to be a great career. Um, First, I thought I was just going to be a writer, and that was great. I covered the Phillies in 92 and 93 as George King's backup, and I was just fresh out of college. I switched from being a biology major to being a communications major the last year just to graduate, which I did. If I go back now, I can get a biology degree probably in a semester, um, which I wouldn't be good with that degree at all. you know. Um, But anyway, so I... I started doing little broadcasting here and there, and I I actually did high school games on WTTM, uh, baseball and basketball, and that was my first experience. And I had a buddy of mine, Harvey Yavner, who's a great writer, writes, wrote for the Trenton Times, is just a wonderful columnist, wrote for the Trentonian as well. I did the Trenton Atlantic City game, and I remember being in the the office, because I was covering it for the paper too, but I did play-by-play for it. And he walked in and he said, hey, Boog. And they called me Boog because uh, at the time I had a 
thick head of hair and he looked like Boog Powell uh, playing first base, you know, still playing summer ball, uh, playing, you know, different semi-pro tournaments and stuff like that. And I was starting to put on a little weight at the time. Uh, he goes, Boog, heard you do the game today. I said, yeah, yeah, what'd you think? He goes, stick to writing. <laughs> <laughs> and all I could do was laugh. I mean, at that point you had no thick skin, so you would normally be, you would normally sit there and say, oh no, what am I going to do? But all I could do was laugh. It was the funniest thing in the world. Uh, but from there, I did the Babe Ruth World Series uh, in Ewing and sold the time to different cities around the country. Didn't make any money, but I was still broadcasting yeah, baseball yeah. games, and it was great. Um, I also, at that time, you know, my wife and I had graduated in 90. I had met her in 89 at school, and uh, she had some family in South Carolina. And I was writing for the Trenton Times. I was doing a minor league weekly minor league story on Jeff Manto and guys like that. And there was a guy from Trenton State named Dave Lieback, who was Burlington County guy. He was playing for the Charleston Rainbows, the Padres single-A affiliate. Thought I'll go down and do a story on him, meet the rest of my wife's family. And I called the broadcaster at the time. His name was Rich Jablonski. I still talk to him. And I said, introduced myself, told him what I was doing. He said, listen, I'd really like to do play-by-play -play professionally. Can I sit in and listen to how you do the games? He said, sure. I got down there for four game series. I not only sat in, I did the games with him. I did color. Wow. Then the last day, he let me do two innings of play by play. I mean, who would who would let you do that? Incredible. Incredible. Were, you, um, were you able to capture it? Uh, I guess yeah. because I went back in August, again, wasn't planning on it, and did seven more games. I mean, if I'm the owner of the team, I'm going to let some guy from Jersey come in and do games in South Carolina. Demo tape. Was there a demo tape? That was it. Yeah. It turned out to be my demo tape. Yeah. So about that time, Trenton was, uh, there was rumors Trenton was going to bring in a minor league baseball team. I was going to go to the winter meetings that December of 93 and try to find a job as a minor league broadcaster. I was just married. My wife said, okay, as long as it's close, I want to stay within reach of my family. My family was still down in Brick. Uh, my older brother had graduated from Trenton State a couple years before me. My younger brother was at Trenton State. So everybody was close. Well, all of a sudden, I started covering the story about the Thunder coming to Trenton. I mean, who would have thought that baseball would work in Trenton? Well, I applied for the job along with a buddy of mine to be the broadcaster and the PR director. I didn't think I'd get it. I got it. And all of a sudden, this double-A team fell on my lap. Left the, th left the paper, was the PR guy, had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> but figured it out along the way, along with uh, four others who were part of the main front office at the time in November of 93 and prepared for April of 94 for the Detroit Tigers AA affiliate to come to Trenton. Well, if you're the PR guy and the broadcaster for a team, you must have been logged in some pretty serious It was. Here. We all were. Brian Mahoney, who works here at the Phillies now, is the marketing director, uh, drone of the director of marketing sales guys. He was our assistant GM. We're the same age. We hit it off almost immediately. There were five of us that are, were original, and then there were nine of us that were the core of the front office. Uh, to this day, I can name every single one of them and know everything about them. Uh, and we were like a small business. I mean, we not only did our set jobs. I mean, I was the PR guy in charge of the community, all that stuff. But we pulled the tarp. We sold the billboards. We ran the business. It was like running a circus. And it was a great experience. But we logged a lot of hours. Um, and how long were you there? I was there from 94 until uh, the 2000 season. 94 to 96, I was the director of PR and media and the broadcaster. That's when I started doing their TV as well. Um, and then in 97, I was hired as the assistant general manager when Brian Mahoney left to go to Norwich to run their double A team. So I became the assistant general manager Terrific. as well as being the broadcaster. Right. And then did that through the 99 season and was going to go run another minor league team and give up the broadcasting totally. You know, I had at that point, I was 32. My oldest son was... Uh, at that point was four, five. My other son was just born. And I figured I got to get on my life if this isn't working. I turned down a AAA, two AAA jobs because I didn't want to move out of the area. Uh, failed in my attempt to get a couple major league jobs, finished as a, you know, in the top 10 of those and thought, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to run this, 
you know, run this minor league team. And uh, I was driving to sign the contract, and I called our owner, who owns the Thunder, who was going to own this other team. I said, I can't do it. I called my wife and said, I can't do it. And she said, then don't do it. And I decided to resign as the assistant GM, just did the radio, and then started my own radio show on a local ESPN station in Princeton, New Jersey. And did that for a year before my boss at the Phillies had heard the show and needed a guy to do the pre- and post-game show and asked me to come in and try out. And I tried out in 2000 and was hired that, that offseason. Interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody sees the uh, when the lights go on. And, the you know, what I'd like to get into is – What's the life of a big league broadcaster really like? I mean, there's a, I know there's a lot of prep time. The travel is unbelievable. Go into some detail on, you know, what your routine is like. And do you get fatigued just like the players do? It's a long season. I mean, how do you, uh, how do you go about it? You know, it's interesting. Uh, people ask me all the time if, if I get tired. And there are times when I'm probably dragging. But I love it. I mean, I, my energy, I thrive off of what I'm doing. So, you know, I do... The baseball for the full season. Then I start doing the NFL once that that's over with on radio. And then I do college basketball. I do 20 games in college basketball. I mean, I'm a workaholic. I am. But I put it in perspective that a lot of times, if I'm home, I'm home. And my kids are my priority. Uh, but, you know, during the baseball season, we leave. I'll, I'll leave for spring training on the 28th of February, the day after my last basketball game. Be down there for a month. Uh, come back every once in a while to see the kids. Uh, they can't always come down because of their schedules. Um, and the day itself begins in the morning when I get up at 7 to help them get to school. My wife does most of the work, but I do at least see them. And then I read. I'll read from anywhere from 9 till 11, 11.30, read newspapers from all the teams in the East, Eastern Division, and then the teams we're facing and stuff like that. Uh, and then I'll get my book ready for the night. And I'll usually get here about 2.30 and then prepare for the game, talk to the players and stuff like that, and do whatever interview responsibilities I have because there are some interview responsibilities. What's that mean, get your uh, book ready? What do you my scorebook. Your scorebook. Yeah, everybody has a different scorebook. Um, you know, Scott and I always joke because we're always changing. Scott Franz and I, we're always changing our scorebook. Uh, Sarge doesn't have one. L.A. is meticulous with his. Wheels hasn't changed his in years, uh, but they both have great hand- handwriting. Scott and I tinker with ours all the time, uh, but we get our book ready. We both have made up our own book, you know, on Excel. I have a different one for baseball, basketball, and football, and I have like four different styles depending on the mood I'm in. Uh, if I feel like I'm really prepared, I go with a smaller one. If I feel like I need to get better prepared, I go for a bigger one. Uh, and we just get that ready, you know, get the pitcher's part of it ready. You know, we write notes about the starting pitcher, notes about who's in the bullpen, stuff like that. Um, we're like kids. I mean, it's if you love this game, I mean, it's it's not rocket science, and it's uh, it's the most enjoyable thing in the world. You really try to over prepare, don't you? Because there's I think there's you so do. much information. There's so much to fill in a baseball game. Uh, you do because there's stuff that I'll do. I, I won't use it for maybe a week. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, I'll say, "Well, you know, I was I was just going over the rule book for 2012, and there's a couple of new rules, but a couple in particular that." we're probably going to use in spring training. So I made notes of those, sent them off to our associate producer, who's wonderful, and those are ready to go. But that's the research that you do that you sometimes you won't use it. But then maybe a week later it'll come up and you're like, oh, this is what I read. So here we go. So that's important. But the days, you know, people say the days are long, but I, I will never, ever, ever, ever complain about it because it's, again, it's I'm living everybody's dream, and I know it. And I respect it and appreciate it, too. But, um, do you have much interaction with the players yeah, during, during the season? a lot. And even in the off-season. I mean, we're always doing dinners together. Not all, not all the time, but sometimes. Um, breakfasts here at the ballpark. But that's why I get here early, because I feel like that's the best time to get them. Because they're here early. This group is here early. So what, what time do they get here for a summer? It depends on the guy, but a lot of them get here at noon. Mm-hmm. Some get here at 2.30. And the rest arrive by three. And and what are they doing? Are they working out? Working out. Studying film? Studying film. Take an extra BP. Raul Ibanez would take BP like you never saw somebody take BP. Really? Ryan Howard feverishly works on his BP. Uh, Roy Halladay is a workout machine. He, I think he's always here. 
wait, I just read where he gets to the uh, spring training facility yeah. at 5 in the morning. Yeah, so he can get, then get home when he needs to. Yeah. Now, it's different when we start games, but he can get home at a reasonable time to be with his kids, too. Uh, but, yeah, they're all – this is this is a working man's team. And it's easy for me to get information if I'm here early enough because the clubhouse is not open to everybody but because – we're the broadcasters that work for the team, and yeah. you know, we can kind of find our way in there and talk to the players, which is great. Is there anybody particularly good or interesting to work with from a player? This is a great group. Uh, Victorino's easy to work with. Um, you know, Jimmy Rollins. You know, when you sit him down, is easy to work with. Um, the bullpen guys are great. Now it's different. Now it's a different bullpen this year, but they were always great. Chad Durbin, Brad Lidge, guys like that, just phenomenal. Ryan Matson, phenomenal. Um, you know, but they're. I, I have certain go-to guys that if I need an opinion about something, let me yeah. run this by you. Sarge talked about this. Give me your feelings on that. But I can do that with any of them. Over the years, were there, so you don't have to name any names, obviously, but were there guys that were less? Oh, yeah. Like, There's always guys like that. With and... There's always guys like that. I tell people, you know, that 93 team, as beloved as they were by the fans, they were a tough bunch to yeah. get interviews for. I was writing at the time, uh, covering it for George King, who was a renowned writer. Works for the Post now, covering the Yankees, and it was hard sometimes. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't want to do this for a living. And, and honestly, I did. I walked away saying, I'm not going to do this for a living. I can't do this. I need to do something where it's more personal. Uh, but it's different now with this crew as being one of the team's broadcasters. It's just different. It's easier. Good. Um, tell me a little bit about your broadcast partners. What kind of relationship you have with them? Or do you have a special buddy that you? kind of gravitate towards James. well Fransky and I are, are, are probably the guys that are are together more often than not you know we play golf together um, you know we helped start the foundation with the other guys uh, so and we're similar in age who's the better golfer uh, he is okay. yeah he is he's gotten he's gotten better uh, I, I still have a baseball swing I, I mean I can't get rid of the slice that's just killing me although I think I got it I think I have it um, he probably plays a little bit more than I do uh, but he's definitely improved. Like we were pretty even and I just, I must be thick headed or something like that because wheels is the best golfer. Um, and then Larry and, and Sarge, Larry's gotten really good. We play a lot together yeah. and we're very, I mean, the one thing I can say is that we are unbelievably close as a group that doesn't always happen. Uh, but I consider all of them, you know, my closest friends. I do. You know? So getting, uh, do you, do you have a chance to, to golf when you go on road trips? Do we bring, do. Do you bring yeah. your clubs on? We occasion? bring them. Um, it's not all the time. Right. It depends on the size of the traveling party, uh, but also whether the schedule permits. I don't like to golf often if we have a game. I just feel like it r runs you down. Yeah. Uh, but that's just my prerogative. I mean, I work out as much as I can. Um, some days if I play golf, I won't work out as much. Uh, but we'll play on off days all the time. In fact, every off day we're on the road because we we've had a lot of road games where we're off the last right. couple of years. We play. If I don't come home, because sometimes I'll fly home mm -hmm. if the boys have a game or something like that, but we'll play. Uh, or if, you know, if we're in a city for a couple of days and we have a night game, we'll play. Yeah. But we'll play early, so we're back early, too. How about some of the other uh, broadcast partners' personalities? I mean, uh, yeah, they're all different, yeah. and it's great. <clears throat> you know, Wheels is the, Wheels is the senior guy. Um, very particular in some ways, uh, but is always there if any of us have a question about anything because he knows everything about it. He's, he's the only one who really grew up a Phillies fan. I mean, he grew up a diehard Phillies fan. Scott grew up a Rangers fan. I grew up a Mets fan. Sarge was a Dodger fan. <clears throat> uh, Larry grew up in the Northwest. They didn't really have baseball at the time. Um, he was a fan of somebody. I can't remember who it was, though. But anyway, so... You know, we, he's, and Wheels is like everybody's little brother, too. As strange as that sounds, he's the oldest guy, but we can always needle him a little bit. You know, like we made the, the Wheels, the Chris Wheeler, yeah, the, the Flathead. <laughs> Fransky and I did this, and we brought it all around the city and did things. That was the funniest thing in the world. I mean, it was the greatest thing in the world. Um, we have a fathead that is in the booth of him. You know, just people can buy. We have two seats next to it where they take pictures of it. But he's great that way because we could do it even on the air, and he doesn't blink about it. Um, Sarge is what you see on the air is 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 who he is. Yeah. Uh, he's just he's a remarkable person. He's a great friend, and they all are. Why why do you think Wheels seems to be a lightning rod sometimes for criticism? And I mean, because he's he's done what he's done, I think, so well for so long, but. 
there are times that uh, you know I read or hear that people don't like his style or what. what well, I think style is subjective. Yeah. I think there are going to be people that don't like it and people that do like it. Um, you know, part of it may be because he's he's worked his way into a position of being an analyst, but he never played the game professionally, and that's kind of unheard of to a certain yeah, that's extent. True. Um, but his knowledge is vast. I mean, he was very close with John Vukovic and Larry Boa. And, you know, he learned. I wish I had the retention that he has, honestly. I mean, he's, uh, he's 25 years, 22 years older than I am. But his memory is remarkable. So, I mean, I think that could be part of it. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that, that, that that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, he's just, he's genuinely a, a really nice person. My favorite shot of Wheels was when they, when he was dancing. When, when, no, oh. when, when they clinched the yeah. World Series, and a he was doing years the wheeler, ago, and he was yeah, uh, yeah. And, but that's and Harry made the call. Harry made the call, and he was up there, you know, just he, yeah. he didn't want to step on Harry's lines, but he was pumping. It his was great. And, yeah, was, I was next to them. I was against the wall, pinned against the wall, because I wanted to see, I wanted to hear Harry's call. Yeah. That was important because he had never called a clinching game, and I wanted to. Well, you know, I didn't realize. Yeah, he never called a clinching World Series game because in '80 they weren't on. And oh, in 83, funny. they didn't win. and 93, they didn't win. Wow. So for him to be able to have that accomplishment, I felt it was great to see that happen. It was great to see that happen. Uh, but yeah, the dance was, we called it the wheeler. I mean, it was, it was funny. And we all try to imitate it, and I think we've added our own thing to it. It's not exactly the way he did it, but it's still funny. Uh, uh, you travel a lot. Any favorite away city any favorite restaurant that you always go to uh... I'm pretty simple when it comes to you know it comes to food I really am it's strange as that sounds I mean you know I've been up and down with my weight over the years but I'm pretty simple um, it's tough when you travel it is tough when you travel it's just it's discipline I mean, last year I had a really bad back injury that sort of precluded me from working out and I put on weight I mean I was I put on about 30 pounds which I've since lost but it was uh, you know you need to work out but San Francisco is probably my favorite city to go to because the energy level of the ballpark, ballpark itself. Really? Yeah, I, it's just incredible because they they were good. So, and it's small and you're right on top of everything. Yeah. So I love that. I really do. I love that about it. Um, restaurants, that's a good question. You know, normally it's, if we're off, it's me and Fransky that go out and we, we just try to find a burger or a steak place to, that's it. It's nothing really... We don't really go out of our way to try to find a place. There's, you know, Lydia's in Pen in Pittsburgh is really good. Um, I don't know. We stumbled across that a few years. It, uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Good pasta. Um, you spent some time in New York. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the differences in calling New York baseball versus Philadelphia. That's baseball. a good question. Um, th it's very similar. The fans, the passion, and the knowledge is very similar. Up there, though, the Mets fans root for whoever's playing the Mets and they hate the Yankees. You know, here the, the Phillies fans, they love the Phillies and whoever plays them, they don't like them. Um, so up there, there was two different people that Mets fans were rooting for, you know, rooting against. And that was kind of interesting. Um, but it's very similar. It really is. Up there, when I did the radio, I was an employee of the radio station. Here, I'm an employee of the Phillies. There's a little difference in that, uh, but not much. I found the organizations fairly similar, though, front office-wise. Here, it's more of a family. What uh, is the main difference when you're working for a club versus working for a station? Um, you know, up there, the station is working for the station. If, if you're calling, let's say, a home run for the other team, you call it as if it's a significant part of the game. Here, you kind of back off a little bit because... You know, and as a fan, I don't, I don't want to hear me putting up exclamation point on a, on a Scott Rowland home run or, a, or Brian McCann home run up there. If it's a big home run, it's a big home run. Uh, and I thought that was kind of neat. It was pretty good. It was a pretty good education. You know. Any other differences between the? No, the honestly, teams? it's it's similar. There's a there's, um, here, both places winning losing is not accepted. So that would be, in other cities, I think one of the big differences. I think if you went to the Midwest, they want to win. But if they don't win, they're still going to go, go to the Cubs games. I'm a Cubs fan. I can relate. Yeah. There, it's, it's, so, it's very similar. It really is. You know, there's not a, there's not a lot of differences. Um, the, um, 
any particular moments that come to mind about uh, being on the air? Anything? Halliday's like perfect unexpected game. Unexpected or or yeah or memorable. Halliday's Halliday. perfect game yeah. is that it's it was unexpected and it was memorable. Is that your favorite? Uh, that to your me, favorite? well, I mean, I had I was literally shaking in the last three innings. Uh, I wanted to get it right. I wanted to get the call right. I wanted to get the information right. I didn't want to over talk. You know, people say, well, did you say it was a perfect game? I did because that's part of it. You should say it. You know, it's you're not jinxing it. You're doing your job, that type of stuff. That was memorable. I mean, that was just, that was great. Um, other moments that were funny, there were a lot of Sarge moments that were funny. Like when we interviewed Alyssa Milano and, uh, you know, she's obviously a huge baseball fan, but he started asking her about his, her tattoos, things like that. I mean, that was that was funny. Um, you know, stuff like that. I mean, the light moments, I think, were, you know, were things I remember. I, you know, away from the Phillies, I mean, I once nearly missed an ESPN shift doing the overnight on ESPN National because I fell asleep in my basement. I did it. I have a studio in my basement. <laughs> I used to do shows, and Maryland had just won the national championship, and I was getting ready to go on to do... Todd Wright's overnight show, and I had been doing a lot of shifts, my local show, the ESPN show, so I guess I was tired, and it was a 1 a.m. start, and I had done all these interviews, and I, I, I fell asleep, and my wife had to wake me up because the producer called me to wake me up, and he was, they were all laughing, and he, was, I mean, it was, was funny. It dead, was it dead air? Or did no, 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 we, we had, I had done an interview that made it seem like I was beginning the show. I don't know why, but they just ran that at the beginning, and it was just... Now I can laugh at it, but then I was I was panicked. But Get, getting back to the question about working for a station versus working for a club, and you haven't luckily haven't had to do this much over your uh, your reign here. But you know, say the club is is playing poorly or just playing lackadaisical or making errors they shouldn't make. Do you are you held back from no. your criticism at all? No, or? I mean I think that you have to draw. You have to. There's a certain line that you can't cross, and I think we all have it inside to understand what that line is. I can't really explain what it is, but I don't. I don't s- subscribe to the pounding, pounding, pounding. You know what I mean? I, I think that if Larry or Sarge were to say it or Wheels, that's fine because they're the analysts. You know, Larry and Sarge played the game. So they know when something's done right or wrong. You know, I, I tell the story and try to describe it. Let the pictures really tell the story. And then let the fan kind of deduce what they want to deduce about the game itself. Yeah. I think that's important. But no, there, there's not, I think we all have a, you know, sort of an internal thing that says, all right, let's back off here. Mm-hmm. All right, this is something that you have to say because you can see it. Mm-hmm. Um, editorializing, I don't do that that often, you know, from one station to the other. Um, but I think that, you know, in New York, working for the station itself, I mean, it was a talk station. So you can voice an opinion, I think, there to sort of get a conversation going, even on the talk show itself, on the, on the, in the air itself. So, um, you know, I think that that's, that's okay. Well, to me, Larry Anderson seems to have the, uh, <laughs> the, I mean, his emotion. The life of Riley? Well, oh, no. <laughs> No, but I mean, it's sort of when he sees something on yes. the field, he just has a tendency to speak his mind. Yeah, I think that... Um, very little muffler there. Yeah, and I think on radio, he can do that more often because he's he's describing on TV. I don't think it's as easy to do it. Like, if an umpire makes a mistake, we'll say he made a mistake because you can see it. On radio, it's Larry's eyes that are saying, and he has that honesty that I think you need on radio. Mm-hmm. You do. Mm-hmm. You have to have it. Because you're describing. What you see is what the, the listener sees. So you have to be, if you feel that way, then you should say it. Um, we did a dinner together. I didn't bring up the umpires. He just started talking about the umpires. <laughs> it was really funny. I mean, he obviously, you know, his opinions about umpires, everybody knows. Uh, but I think he's I think he's really good at knowing what's right and what's wrong and when to say it. And I think it's great because he's got a lot of, he's smart. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. He really is. Yeah. Whether it be crossword puzzle, just knowledge about things, he's smart. Do you, as a play-by-play guy, do you consciously call a game different on radio than you would on TV? Oh, absolutely. Or do you try to paint the picture more? I am radio? a radio guy who has been doing TV now for on for football and basketball for eight years. For baseball, this will be my fifth year. I did some of the minor leagues. But I'm a radio guy. And the first few years I did it, and even now there's times where I'll say, shut up that you, you just can't talk as much on TV. You can't. On radio, you're talking. You're describing. You're letting some dead air in there to let the atmosphere fill. 
but you are describing. I find sometimes when I go back and do a game on radio that it takes me an inning or so to catch up because um, it's the speed of it. It seems slower, but it is faster. Um, you know, football is one of my favorite things to call on radio, and I still do it. I do the NFL every week once the Philly season's over. That, I don't feel like I miss a beat, but there is a description and a tone that's different. I sound different on radio than I do on TV. You know, and I think that there's probably even more room for me to be able to not talk as much on TV, but that's part of just me trying to get better. Explain the, this magical ride that the Phillies have mm. been on these last five great. years. I mean, I'm sure, you know, I can imagine, you know, again, being from Chicago, following the Cubs, you know, when they're out of it in July, it's got to be more of a burden on a broadcaster to try to inject life into a game, into a team that you know is not yeah. going anywhere. You, you haven't had to deal with that. This team has been Have electrifying for the, at least the last five years. Well, and you can go back to 2001 when Boa took over. I mean, that's what it started. I mean, they were in a hunt for a wild card. And even at that point, the games were important. They, they weren't as exciting as these games, but there was still something to it. Uh, the greatest thing I can say is that if you walked up and started talking to a 14-year-old boy from Philadelphia or a girl from Philadelphia and talked to them about winning and losing, they don't know what it's like to lose <laughs> as a Phillies fan. I mean, isn't that remarkable? Yes. That, to me, is remarkable. So, so, gentlemen, excuse me real fast. Hey, Jeremy hey, Messler. Tom McCarthy. Take some pictures. Hey, okay. Real quick, so we can figure out what we're going to set up. Are you opposed to going outside? No. Okay. No, whatever you want. I think it might look a little cleaner than in your broadcast room. Okay. Because it's all packed up and there's not much there. Or the radio booth, you can look at that maybe, okay. too. It's up to you, but I don't mind going outside. Right. I mean, it would be, would be under the overpass because it's starting to spit a little That's bit. That's fine. That way we can at least... If the field wasn't covered up in white, I'd do the broadcast, but it's kind of hard to... Not see the white. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's fine. And, 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 and Whatever you want. Yeah, Actually, good. the only thing I, I'd ask is maybe you could take a couple pictures of me and Tom together for the website before, and then, then I'm going to leave, and then you guys can sure. do what you Yeah, that's fine. Do, so. All right, so we'll find us somewhere outside where we can see the Phillies in the Citizen Banks Park. And, okay. Unless, yeah, yeah. There's something, unless there was something that you had in mind. No, I didn't have anything in okay. mind. I'm good for anything. Chris, well, is there anything you, you can think of? You should never see her for anything. Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> I mean, inside, I showed him radio, I showed him TV, and I showed him press Media box. room? It's kind of blah. Yeah, it is blah. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's fine. And the only other cliche thing, do you, you use a headset? That's what you use? Or is there an actual microphone? It's a headset. It, is headset. it should be in there, it's actually. Yeah. Right. And we're, we're not going to be that much longer. So okay. We're only going right. to be in we'll five minutes or so. Oh, so, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm I, I got stuff. Okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Whatever time okay. we do. Perfect. We'll get set up. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, so, so getting back to this... Uh, this incredible run of success yeah. that the Phillies have had. I mean, it's got to make it fun to come to the It does. It day. does. I mean, it's the perfect storm. Um, even when I left for the two years, I was always watching. I was always listening. You know, because I, I love the people here. I mean, this is this front office is like nothing you've ever seen before. It really is you know, like nothing you've ever seen before. And I've been lucky from my time at the Thunder to here. But this team is just, <laughs> it's just remarkable. I, I mean, back... I always tell people back about 20 years ago, if you said that there was going to be a holiday in a Phillies uniform, people would think, what, his brother? I mean, you wouldn't think it would be the guy. Right. You know, or Lee, I mean, Howard, Utley. These are the best. Well, as a guy who's been here for quite a while, how has this franchise been able to morph itself into one that's so proactive and so willing to spend money? Is it the stadium that's bringing It's the, the stadium. It is. is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a... It's a very cooperative ownership group. It's talented GMs. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's the, the, the Cliff it's, Lee thing last year. It's oh, the perfect they, storm. And they, and they seem to do it one after another. Yeah. After another. It's, it's the perfect storm. It's the fact that in 2001 they started getting better and that Jim Tomey came here and Kevin Millwood came here and even, you know, even David Bell, who did not perform the way everybody expected, he came here. You know, they made that, that good trade to get Millwood, even though Johnny Estrada was an up and coming catcher. And then the stadium. I mean, this place is remarkable. And it's like a perfect storm. It started getting good, and the stadium opens. We'll just do it in the radio room. Okay. We're going to hang. Chris is going to get some stats. We'll hang on the wall. and Okay. We'll do it in there. That's fine. And if we feel the need and we have the time, we can go outside, then we'll do that. We'll worry about that then. But That's fine. Just make it easier. Sure. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Yeah, but I think the, uh, the perfect storm of the stadium coming along at the right time, and the, the kind of stadium it is. You know, there are different ballparks around the country that are nice, the new ones. Yeah. They're not like this. You know, there's an intimacy and there's an energy and there's a setup. Even as people talked about, well, when you look out, when it opened, 
you see the Holiday Inn and the city's in the distance. It's not right there like Pittsburgh. But even that, I mean, there's a charm to seeing a beautifully lit up Philadelphia at, at night. Uh, you know, when the stadium was first built, it was criticized as being a band, band box, box. Right. Right. And then they actually did move the wall back a bit. A right? tad, yeah. Right. And they, they're, the thought was that they might have trouble attracting free agent pitchers because of that. Obviously, that has not been the case. Winning changes everything. It does. I mean, it does. I mean, they the team was built perfectly for this ballpark. Uh, and they had enough pitching in 2008 to, to win the title. Uh, and then I think that if you asked any free agent pitcher right now, doesn't matter who they are. Where would you want to play? If Philadelphia wasn't on the top of the list, it'd be in the top three. Mm-hmm. And it's because of the organization. It's because of the team. It's because of Charlie. Um, so many different things. Mm-hmm. And it's the perfect storm. Mm-hmm. And it's like it's a once in a decade type of thing. And hopefully, and I think it will continue because I think there's a there's a a, a way that they've built this that it will sustain itself. Um, you know, as a fan. Um, Growing up, I'm not so sure I'm not more of a Wrigley Field fan than I am a Cubs fan because, yeah, you know, you could just, you actually can fall in love with the ballpark. And, uh, yeah, I love it. By the way, I, uh, I root for two teams fervently, the Cubs and the Eagles, and I'm on a 152 year dry spell. So actually, people, <laughs> people hire me not to root for their teams, but, uh, but yeah, do you, I mean, the, um, what do you think of these some of these new age ballparks? I, mean, um, I think some of them are great. I do. I mean, I love AT and T Park, PNC Park in Pittsburgh is outstanding. They just don't draw that well unless there's certain teams in. But if they win, they will. Uh, but to me, if you ask me my top five ballparks, they would go. You know, I love AT and T Park. I do. Uh, but Wrigley Field and Fenway would be in the top five, and they would be up toward the top. Because I love the charm of it. I mean, I know that the seats are tough to sit in at both places, particularly for guys that are tall like you and I. But it's still to go and watch a game there. See, when I go to those places, I, I sense history. I, I do. That's I, it. I sense Babe Ruth being on the field. Well, and, even the neighborhood yeah. itself for both of them. I mean, the brownstones and just it's it. It's the history of it. Um, you know, if you ask my boys who are young baseball fans what their favorite ballpark is, you know, they're both going to put Fenway Park in their top three. My oldest one has gone to Wrigley. My 14-year-old hasn't. My oldest loved Wrigley Field. I mean, absolutely loved every bit of it. You know, and I don't know how you can't. If you're, if you're a baseball fan, I don't know how you can't. Tell me a little bit about Charlie. You know, it's funny that um, he was, he and the team was widely criticized when he was hired because... Mm-hmm. Of, of his obvious somewhat lack of communication skills or polish or whatever. Polish, I think that's it, a right? good way of putting right. it. Yeah. What what kind of a guy is he? I mean, and how has he he been able to transform this team? And obviously, he's had a big, uh, you know, putting a team on the field yeah. is one thing. Getting them to play the right way is another. He's obviously done that. What do you think? His well, I, I think he's I think he's been true to himself. To be honest with you, I mean, he hasn't changed one iota. He hasn't. Winning hasn't changed him. He's still the same guy. He was the same guy when he was a, a consultant for the Phillies as he is now. Um, I think he keeps a relaxed clubhouse. Like, he doesn't panic. He never shows it on his face. He never shows it in his body language. And I like people like that because I think if you start to panic, then everybody else around you will panic. And these guys don't panic. Um, you know, I think he's smart, but he's, he's gut smart. You know, the game of baseball is statistically driven, and he does look at stats, but he also decides in his mind and in his gut and his heart what he's going to do to make a move. Uh, I think he's tough when he has to be. He even said this year that he probably wasn't tough enough behind, last year. Behind closed doors? He's oh, yeah, to be... but it's it's one-on-one. He will not bring anybody, like is take there, anybody down, undress any anybody. Room, locker room meetings that he has? He has or... them. He doesn't like to have them that often yeah. because, as he said, and this is actually a good point, if I have them and they don't work, then the self-doubt, expands. Mm-hmm. And I think there's some truth to that. He has a lot of one-on-one st- time. So if he sees a guy not playing up to his potential or hustling or doing whatever he's perturbed at, he's more than likely to bring him in his office and talk. Almost to him. immediately. Yeah. Or he'll talk to them as he's walking around from locker to locker because he does that kind of, he does that often too. Um, I think he's, like I said, I think he is who he is. You know, he hasn't changed for anybody's sake. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that is, that doesn't help him, but most times it does. Yeah. Uh, and he and I have become very close. I mean, we do a TV show together 
that we have a good time doing. Uh, and I'll tell you a quick story about them. You know, I do a, a baseball hot stove dinner every year for the high school baseball team in my town. It's my way of kind of giving back to my boys. We've done it for five years. It's grown from 130 people to this year we had 375 people. And we raised a pretty good amount of money. And the keynotes this, this year were Charlie Manuel, Dan Plesak, who was a friend when he was here and still is, Scott Fransky and Larry Anderson. And Charlie, I said to him, I said, you know, if, if there's anything I can do, he goes, you've done enough. You know, I mean, he's just compassionate when he needs to be and is very loyal. Yeah. If you're loyal to him, he'll, he's very loyal to you. And I think you can see that with the way the players respond to him. Think he's going to hang around for a while? I think he'll hang around as long as he wants to. Honestly, I don't think that he's, it's if he decides. It's a two-year deal, right? Yeah, and he's 68. Yeah. If he decides he wants to keep managing the Phillies, he's the all-time winningest manager, right. um, then I think he's earned the right to manage them as long as he wants to. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's that's great for him. You know, sometimes we make changes in this world just to make changes because somebody's been there for a long period yeah. of time. But he's had an, an awful lot of success. Yeah. You know, go back to the fact that if you ask a 15-year-old what it's like to lose as a baseball fan, you know, what are you talking about? I don't lose as a baseball fan. Yeah. What uh, in closing? Anything you want to add? I mean, this has been you've been very generous with your time, and I think it's going to be a great uh, interview, both in print and on the web. Anything uh, that you want the people to know about you or your job or anything? Uh, that, uh, I, I mean, I, I think people know that I feel like I'm as lucky as anybody in the world to be be able to do this, and I respect it more than anything else in the world and cherish it. Um, and I look forward to coming to work every day. I mean, we have an unbelievable group that we're around and you know we're all the closest of friends and that makes it even easier um you know but i've been very fortunate there are a lot of people that have helped me along the way that i can't thank individually from rich jablonski in south carolina to joe finley the owner of the the thunder to you know jim gogger the former editor at the trenton times who let me do broadcast games and cover them for the paper because he knew it was important for me to broadcast the games i mean I've just been lucky and I hope that everybody else can be as lucky as I am. And, you know, uh, and I just, I love being here. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Tom McCarthy, thanks for uh, 